Now, our message this morning begins with a unique and fascinating story, and I believe there's a picture here. Yeah, there we are. It's a story about a man in some good food and a party. Now, Jesus' parable settles around this man inviting uh, guests to his party. In the backdrop of the story takes place while Jesus is dining with a group of prominent Pharisees. And while Jesus is with his guests, he begins intentionally dissecting the situation he finds himself in by addressing a particular set of beliefs and practices that are taking place. The first thing that happens uh, while he's with his group is a man that has abnormal swelling comes to him in, in looking for healing. And, and so Jesus asks the, the, the group of Pharisees, is, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus goes ahead and he heals this man, and then he says to the, this group, if your child or an ox fell in the well, would you not go and pull them out? Then he addresses the guests uh, that are surrounding the table who pick their places of honor while eating uh, and while dining, and then he proceeds to tell the story, uh, a parable about picking the lowest place at the table out of humility to save yourself the embarrassment of being removed from uh, the place of honor by the host. And that's where our reading picks up this morning, from Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 24. Jesus then, he he turns to his host, he says, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaims, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied with this story, the story that we're going to be focusing on this morning. He says, A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent out his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and I must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I can't come. Some decent excuses here. I, I, can't, I can't complain too much about this. But the servant then returns and, and tells his master what had happened, what had been said. And the master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still more room, or there is room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those first I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. This is, story, or this is the word of God for the people of God. So we're going to look at the story, and we're going to come back to it in a minute. But before we do that, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important to point out that at the center and backdrop of Jesus telling this parable and telling this story, he's having a meal with other people. And it's within this parable, in and of itself, a meal creates an amazing opportunity for something profound and powerful that can easily get overlooked when we read this story. And we'll come back to that. But first, I just want to share a personal story. Now, when I was a kid, uh, every Thanksgiving we would go down to my grandparents' house. They lived in the same town as us. Um, so in, in the days leading up to Thanksgiving, my grandma would put us to work because that's how it goes, right? Grandmas know what they're doing. So Thanksgiving, our job was to help set up, and we have a big family. So, of course, we have to go get all the extra tables, the chairs, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Now, what do you do when you have a table uh, th- that you need to create more space and more room with everybody coming in? You have to go grab the leaf for the table, right? And so my grandma, she says, hey, Gary, I need you. I'm like seven or eight at the time. Hey, Gary, I need you to go grab the leaf for the table. And I'm like, you want, you want, me, to go, you want me to go outside and get, like grab the leaves from outside? What are you talking about? What's a leaf? She's like, the leaf, the, the leaf for the table. I'm like, what are you talking about, grandma? She's it's the leaf, the, the thing that goes in the middle of the table. I've never heard of that before in my entire life. I'm seven or eight years old. That, like, this idea of a, a, a leaf, like, I don't know how it got its name like that, but um, it's super confusing to a young kid, right? 
But anyway, I, I, we would, I went and grabbed the leaf. We dusted that thing off because you, you only pull it out like every like once a year or every six months or so just so that you can make the, you know, the table bigger. So I grabbed the leaf, dusted it off. We pulled the table, set it in, and it creates this bigger space for everybody to come in. And we would set up the additional tables for the, the younger kids and you know, the card table for all the snacks and treats and then, you know, of course, the pies and stuff. So by the time everything was done, you know, it looked like we were inviting the entire town over for Thanksgiving. And it was the same way at Christmas time as well, like the same operation. You know, those were some of my favorite memories, that, you know, the anticipation of family and, you know, sometimes friends coming over for a shared meal and experience. It never failed because you would always get that one uncle or that one cousin. You know what I'm talking about, that one uncle or that one cousin or that family member that you're just like, man, if they show up, this, this thing could get out of hand very quickly. You all have someone in mind. I know it. I can see your faces. I have the same thing. You know, but the, th- the crazy thing is, you know, they, they're always invited. They were always welcomed. And I think as a church, that's really how it should be, right, when it comes to our gathering and our space. We're all, whether you're afraid to admit it or not, we're all a bunch of oddballs and outcasts. And misfits welcomed at the table, and there's always, always, always room for more. Now, I didn't always think or feel that way. I grew up and, and ministered really within a system for a number of years that leaned heavily on the sacredness of the Eucharist, right? And it completely missed the openness of Jesus' invitation for all to participate. You know, I would often hear that at the churches I, I, I pastored at and even grew up in, they would always have a communion meditation. And in order, they would always say, a lot of them hit upon the same idea, which is, you know, when you come to communion, you have to examine yourself properly because that's what Paul says to do in Corinthians. And if you don't, you're sinning, sinning against Jesus himself, right? When you partake of these emblems, if you don't focus your mind and heart right, you know, you're sinning against God. And a lot of times that's what their meditation would, you know, exemplify. That's what they would say would happen. So they would always point out that one specific thing. And additionally, only members of the church or those who had been baptized could participate in the meal. So the bread, the wine, and the act of belonging together as a group of people would, could only be accessed through following a set of rules that Jesus did not set out to establish. And it's passages like the one that we're looking at this morning that really opened my, eye, my eyes to the idea that God's kingdom is way more inclusive and open to the world around us than we can possibly imagine. And to create boundaries around his extensive grace is damaging to the people he loves and that he calls us to love. We, the church as a whole, need to do a better job of dusting off that leaf, expanding the table and sending out more chairs and plates so that our neighbors have a place to sit when they come to experience the ever-expanding hospitality of God. Going back to that parable for a second, Jesus' response uh, about the invitation to the poor, the crippled, blind, and lame, comes, it comes on the heel of the man exclaiming how wonderful it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And I don't want us to miss this, okay? When Jesus tells them this parable, it's as if he's openly ex- explaining to those around him, you know you can actually experience that, the kingdom of God, this whole idea of having a banquet in the kingdom of God, you can actually experience that here and now. Like, you, you know you can actually experience that, like, with, with everyone. Because there's no discrimination, there's no alienation, there's no hatred, division, greed, or lust for power in the kingdom of God. And you could probably imagine the reaction, right? Oh, well, we, we can't do that. We have more important things to do. And Jesus knew this, Right? Which is why in the parable, those initially invited have an excuse for why they can't. Why there's there's no reason they can go to the banquet in the first place. So Jesus is pointing out the very obvious, hey, you got this backwards, people. Jesus is pointing out their, their big flaw, which is they're more concerned about the pomp and the parades and the power. They couldn't possibly care about those in need around them. And that's the beauty of this parable, is that on the surface we catch a glimpse of Jesus pointing out this issue But lurking just below the surface is a much bigger theme, which is this. The kingdom of God is for all. 
and Jesus wants us to emphasize loving our neighbor rather than elevating ourselves. In Rachel Held Evans' book, uh, Searching for Sunday, she says this, it's, it's Christ's table, right? Christ sends out the invitations, and if he has, if he has to run in, through the streets gathering up the riffraff to fill up his house, then that's exactly what he'll do. We are like, who are we to try and block the door? And she continues on with this powerful statement, and I have a picture of this. She says, there are always folks who fancy themselves bouncers to the heavenly banquet charged with keeping the wrong people away from the table and out of the church. Evangelicalism is partic- or in particular has seen a resurgence in Border Patrol Christianity in recent years as alliances and coalitions formed around shared theological distinctives elevate secondary issues to primary ones and declare anyone who fails to conform to their strict set of beliefs and behaviors unfit for Christian fellowship. Committed to purifying the church, of every errant thought, difference of opinion, or variation of practice, these self-appointed gatekeepers tie up heavy loads on legalistic rules and place them on weary people's shoulders. They strain out the gnats in everyone else's theology while swallowing their own camel-sized inconsistency. They slam the door of the kingdom in people's faces and tell them to come back when they are sober, back on their feet, doubtless submissive and straight. But the gospel doesn't need a coalition devoted to keeping the wrong people out. It needs a family of sinners, saved by grace, committed to tearing down the walls, throwing open the doors, and shouting, Welcome, there's bread and wine. Come and eat with us and talk. This isn't a kingdom for the worthy, it's a kingdom for the hungry. I don't think Jesus was too worried about who he was dining with. In his book, A Bigger Table, John Pavlovitz writes, in Jesus' day, the act of sharing a meal with someone was a sign of respect, of association with another, of one's willingness to be seen in fellowship. It was a a very public endorsement. Because of this, Jesus' diverse choice of meal companions often made people really angry. When we look to expand the table, we will invariably be pulled in all directions by those who are more interested in claiming ownership of our allegiance than extending grace to the other. Jesus didn't meet with just those who were deemed his social equals or those who could further his cause or those who would boost his platform. He had friends in low places too. That was the strategic beauty of, the, of his scandalous, scandalously diverse guest list. By not being selective with his invitation, Jesus affirms the value in his, of his companions to them and to those watching from a distance. Rachel Held Evans says a little bit further on in her book, the Apostle Peter continued this pattern, this idea of meeting with those that are different than you around the table. And she says, but he, he, he took it further by daring to dine with the Gentiles. When Peter was invited to the, hor- uh, the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, he declared, you are well aware that it is against our law for Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean Sometimes the most radical act of Christian obedience is to share a meal with someone new. The table can transform even our enemies into companions. The table reminds us that as brothers and sisters adopted into God's family um, and invited to God's banquet, we are stuck with each other. We're family, whether we want to admit that or not. We might as well make peace. The table teaches us that faith isn't about being right or good or in agreement. Faith is about feeding, and being fed. One of the things I appreciated and valued growing up, um, I I played sports in high school, all throughout middle school as well, a little bit in college. And what I enjoyed the most about it was the opportunity to come together as a team. There was a sense of unity that we would often get playing sports and being on a team that really nothing else could recreate. You see, you have people from all different walks of life come together with one common goal and purpose. You know, I think about high school. I think about our our football team. We had a, we, we, I grew up in a small town of like 15, 1600 people. My graduating class was 63. But a large portion of our, our, the guys in high school were on the football team. And you have people coming from 
homes with single parents. We have the kids that wear name brand everything because their parents will just buy them everything. You have kids on free lunch. You have kids with anxiety about their GPA and where they're going to go to college after they finish high school. You have the kids that don't even know what they're going to do after high school. You have the tall kid. You have the short kid. You have the class clown. You have the quiet and reserved kid. You have the partier. Then you have the evangelist hanging out with the partier because of, you know, got to win them over, right? They all come together, right? They all come together. They lace up their shoes, their cleats, and put on their pads. They throw on a uniform, and for just a brief moment in time, they become a team. They become an amoeba of collective experiences and stories that roll into one giant machine working together. There's, there's just something magical about that, being a part of something like that. I think there's something sacred that happens within the context of this story in the same way over a shared meal. You have people, individuals coming from all different walks of life to share a meal around the table. And in this story, we get a strong glimpse of what the gospel represents. It's a sense of belonging. There's no gatekeeping. There's no alienating. But it's a gathering of all people to join in together in community. And that's what we do when we come to this place. Centered at the front of the room, we have a table with bread and wine. And as we've always done uh, as a community of believers, we've always said, you're welcome. You're welcome at this table. You know, this could be your first time in church ever. This could be your first time in church in years. It doesn't matter. Are you baptized? Cool. Are you still on the path of following Jesus? Great. Are you a kid? Awesome. You're welcome at this table. It doesn't matter where you are in your faith journey. You are welcome in this place because we're all family. We're all in this together. And it's an invitation for anyone and everyone to join in a meal. And it's something sacred and holy. And it's an experience for all to join in together. So at this time, I'd like to invite you to partake in this meal, shared together as a community of believers, remembering the life that Jesus lived and exemplified and called us to live, to be a blessing, for him to be a blessing to us and for us to be a blessing to others. So will you join me this morning in a time of communion?